With 8.2 million people, it's America's most populous city, known for its famous skyline. But its towering landmarks only hide the dark world below. Oh, man, this is cool. An underworld built by mobsters, bootleggers, and secret societies. From a midtown speakeasy that defied the feds. Oh, man. Fought the mob and served New York's most famous clientele. Oh, how cool is this? To a massive labyrinth beneath the streets, chiseled out by an elusive brotherhood. These are the sand hogs. With one of the deadliest jobs on the planet. To the oldest subway tunnel in the world. On here, underneath the streets of Brooklyn, New York. A tunnel hiding an assassin's diary and the secret world of the Freemasons. There's even the seedy underground of an ancient Chinese gang. We're peeling back the layers of time on Cities of the Underworld. New York's Secret Societies. I'm Don Wildman. I'm in New York City. Now, most of the world would recognize this city's famous skyline and most of its 8 million residents would tell you they know everything about this town. But the fact is, the foundations of New York were laid by secret societies. To this day, there's an elusive brotherhood who dig billion dollar tunnels beneath this entire city. But it goes back even further, to immigrant enclaves, to Chinese gangs, and to the mob. Even America's most famous and most powerful secret society, the Freemasons, laid the foundations of revolution and the birth of a nation right here in New York. Now, for many people, New York is just the greatest city in the world. But there's a flip side to the metropolis everyone thinks they know. And it's one few have seen before. From the mid-1800s on, the Big Apple built its massive underworld. Nearly a thousand miles of subway lines. 6,437 miles of sewers and over a dozen transport tunnels running under its rivers. Within that complex web are 17th century forts, smugglers tunnels and dens of vice. An unseen subterranean maze beneath one of the world's most important cities. In the roaring 1920s, a different kind of underworld emerged. No town partied like New York City. From its exclusive downtown restaurants to its uptown jazz clubs, the only problem was most of it was illegal. In January 1920, the federal ban on alcohol took effect. Prohibition put the nation's bars and saloons out of business, but the ban only sent the highly lucrative booze business underground. In just five years, up to 100,000 speakeasies opened all over the city, most owned and operated by the mob. Midtown Manhattan became the secret gathering spot for New York's high society to get a drink. This is 52nd Street in Manhattan. Today it's Rockefeller Center. But back in the days of Prohibition, this was one speakeasy after another. Swing Street, they call it, or the wettest street in New York. Today there's one last speakeasy remaining, the famous 21. And I'm meeting a guy who's taking me inside. By the 1930s, the stretch of West 52nd Street between 5th and 6th Avenues was home to over 30 speakeasies. But the swanky 21 Club stood out from the crowd. The club's current manager, Brian McGuire, showed me how the legendary speakeasy survived gangland threats and federal raids with state-of-the-art security and an underground lair. Now, is this the original room that we're in here? This is yeah. the original restaurant? Yes, Don. This is, uh, this is building 21, 21 West 52nd Street, Okay. Uh, which was the original restaurant. 21 today is three brownstone buildings, buildings 21, 19, and 17, the other two buildings being acquired over time. Mm -hmm. But the original restaurant was just this one brownstone. The brownstone looked ordinary from the outside, but its interior was designed to please its famous clientele. 21 was only open to the best of the best in New York. Movie stars, millionaires, even the mayor was a regular. This was probably the creme de la creme. 21 might have been one of the top two or three in New York City at the time. The club's reputation spread and brought unwanted intruders. Federal agents who raided the restaurant in 1930 and mobsters who wanted a piece of its wealthy clientele. The owners fought back with an ingenious security system that would prevent 21 from being caught red-handed again. 
Their top priority was hiding the illegal stash. Over 2,000 cases of wine and liquor with the ultimate in urban camouflage. This is the wine cellar here? Well, the wine cellar is here, if you can find it. It's an alcove. It's an alcove. Now, how do you get there? Where your right hand is, yeah. is you'll find an 18-inch meat skewer. This thing. OK, and what's okay. key is that's the key to the door. Now show me how it's done. OK. There's thousands of holes. They found the right hole, and the click you just heard was the lock on a 4,000-pound door 4, pound, this is 4,000 4, pounds? 4,000 pounds, because it's part of the foundation uh -huh. wall. And Don, you look pretty strong, so I'm going to ask you to give that a little push. Whoa. It's a brick wall, basically. Brick wall. Ugh, man, it is really heavy. Wow. I am seriously pushing here. Oh, man. Oh, how cool is this? That is a whole brick wall look at this thing look it's like there's the brick wall built into a steel frame look behind it and there's the rock and the and oh, it's really amazing the hidden door was an ingenious last line of defense but security at 21 club started from the top down the doorman kept an eye out through a window in the front door if he saw federal agents he hit an alarm buzzer the patrons would down their drinks while the bartender pressed a second button. This triggered fold-away shelves on the bar to tip backwards into the walls, dumping all the liquor bottles and glasses. Within the walls, everything fell down pre-built shafts that fed directly into New York's massive sewer system. By the time the feds got through the front door, nothing was left but a restaurant full of well-heeled customers. The wine cellar was not only ingeniously hidden by the secret door and the meat skewer lock, it wasn't even in the same building. In 1930, 21 didn't span all three buildings as it does today. So when federal agents searched its lowest levels looking for secret compartments, they never suspected that they'd been built into the neighboring basement. Look at this door. It is a relic of a time. The stakes were high. I mean, prohibition was the source of corruption, murder, mayhem in this country. And for them, for the owners of this establishment, 21, this door prevented the worst possible disaster. That the federal government finds out that you have this, a wine cellar, booze of this caliber. I mean, look at it. It's amazing. It's a treasure now. But at the time, it was dynamite. Although in 1919, not all booze was top shelf. And you got some, uh, your basic gin, domestic gin. Not just domestic gin, this is bathtub gin made in, uh, as you can see, in 1919. So this so. is the real prohibition kind of That's gin. That's the real prohibition stuff. The secret seller's greatest protection was its famous clientele. In fact, this basement was the private drinking parlor for the mayor of New York, Jimmy Walker, who liked his booze as much as he liked chorus girls. He needed a place away from the prying eyes of the public to indulge in both, and didn't take too kindly to the Fed's attempts to shut down his favorite hangout. This was his actual booth. And he would be down here when the raids would be happening up there. Yeah, the one, the one time where 21 was like officially raided by the government, uh, Jimmy Walker was actually in the restaurant. He was down in the booth, sitting here, uh, having a drink, um, found out that the uh, restaurant was being raided, um, by the government and was so infuriated that he uh, got a telephone brought to him and he called the New York City police force to come over and ticket and tow all of the federal agents cars really? away. Yes. That's good. 21 Club's owners were able to operate without the mob, but during Prohibition, mobsters had as much power as any politician, and they wanted a piece of 21's action. A cutthroat gangster named Legs Diamond tried to take over the club in 1931, and even put a contract out on the 21's owners. Then he got really mad when he found out that his girlfriend had been given a private tour of the basement kitchen by club patron Ernest Hemingway came downstairs with their drinks, uh, came into the kitchen here uh -huh. at 21, 
And uh, um, before you know it, they had... Uh, one thing led to another. One thing led to another. And right here on the... Right here on the stairwells, yeah. We're at the spot where Ernest Hemingway we're, had his way with... With Legs Diamond's girlfriend. Luckily for Hemingway and the club, Legs Diamond was assassinated in Albany the next day by another gangster in the bootlegging trade. Two years later, prohibition ended. Gangsters and feds were no longer a threat. While other speakeasies shut down, 21 didn't. In fact, it became one of New York's most exclusive restaurants. Its hidden wine cellar transformed it into one of the elite wine collections in the city. To this day, 21 secrets are the very reason it survived. Up next. These are the sand hogs, huh? A New York secret society gave our cameras a rare look into their dangerous world, 400 feet below the streets. This is really what's so deadly. People literally die, because wow. yeah. they would have been the only people going that depth for that long anywhere. And later... And so is this, is this legal? Beneath this busy street, the world's oldest subway station still hides an assassin's diary and a link to the city's most famous secret society, the Freemasons. This whole tunnel of the Freemasons, the proof of their involvement in creating our biggest city. In 1626, a Dutchman bought the island of Manhattan from Native Americans for $24. Today, it would cost more than $8 billion. city's crowded underworld is filled with rumors and legends abandoned subway stations ghost trains even railroad tracks that lead to nowhere but while these stories became the stuff of urban legends few New Yorkers realize that there's actually a highly skilled society hollowing out New York's underground hundreds of them have died working on one of the most deadly jobs in the world turning New York's bedrock into a labyrinth beneath the city Walking around New York, you tend to get caught up in the bustle of people and the towering skyscrapers above. But before anything gets built up here, an entire world has to be engineered down below. And for over 130 years, an elusive group of specially trained guys have been working round the clock to do just that. They're called the Sand Hogs. And they work up to 500 feet below the surface to keep New York running up above. Sandhogs get their name from their origins as diggers in New York's sandy soil. But such little documentation exists on them that all we do know has been passed down only from generation to generation. So I met up with a third generation Sandhog, Rich Fitzsimmons. Hey, hey Don, what's up? Rich, yeah, finally got to meet. Right. Who got me exclusive exposure to the select group to find out what daily life is like tunneling over a hundred feet beneath New York. Nice. So yeah, we're gonna show you around the hog house, All introduce right. you to some of the These men. Are the sand hogs, huh? These are them. These, These sand hogs, or Local Union 147, are contracted by the city to do some of the largest and toughest projects in New York's vast underworld. Ever since their first gig in 1872, if there was an underground project in New York, chances are the Sandhogs were responsible for it. The subway, the sewers, the Lincoln Tunnel, the foundations for the Brooklyn Bridge. The list of their work is massive. All right, here we go. Sandhog house, early in the morning. The first shift getting down, quarter to seven in the morning. We're going down together on the man ship train. Here we go. Outside, an elevator takes us down 85 feet to the man trip train, a subterranean work train that works throughout the day, eight stories deep into the heart of New York's bedrock. The tunnel is so far below the surface, it actually runs beneath the East River. And it serves a twofold purpose, bringing workers from the hog house in Queens to their underground work site 1.6 miles away in Manhattan. And it also removes the nearly 3,200 tons of rock and debris that the sand hogs clear out every day from this huge excavation project. Right out here is a conveyor belt. It's taking out the muck that they cut, that's what they call it to the vertical conveyor out in the access tunnel. They used to blast and, and carry out rock the old-fashioned way. Now it's getting revolutionized. 
The muck the Sandhogs clear out is making room for a project that's been in the works for over 40 years, the East Side Access. When completed, this new three and a half mile tunnel will connect the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central Terminal, a long awaited and much needed connection to ease overcrowding on the New York subway. But how do the Sandhogs remove miles of solid Manhattan bedrock? The answer, the tunnel boring machine. I gotta get a hold of the basics here. We are in a tunnel that has been literally bored out by a single machine. Correct. Kind of a miracle, isn't it, that this thing could do this such a precise job as that? Yep, yep, no doubt. I, the actual machine is kind of modeled on the same principle of an earthworm. The previous method for creating a tunnel was much more treacherous. The Sandhogs used conventional drills to create holes in the bedrock, loaded them with dynamite, and blasted forward. But besides being dangerous, the blasts were unpredictable and uneven. Progress could be as little as a few feet a day. Today, the tunnel boring machine drills directly into solid Manhattan bedrock, chews it up, and spits out chunks of rock behind it for easy and safe disposal. Progress has skyrocketed, averaging nearly 50 feet per day. Look at this wall. I mean, it looks like it's been finished off with concrete. This is actually, that's the rock. This is what's been bored through. Manhattan bedrock is notoriously unpredictable. The depth of the bedrock from the surface changes throughout Manhattan. To make sure they have consistent and stable tunnels, east side access is dug 140 feet deep. But boring through bedrock is only step one. Sandhogs have to remove tons of debris, secure the tunnel against collapse, and run utility and waste lines, literally creating the tunnel as the machine digs. And these are sandhogs too. These are all sandhogs, yeah. Oh, they, they got a shovel in their hand, they're sandhogs. <laughs> and if they got a shovel in their hand and they're not, they're trouble. <laughs> While the machine has made life somewhat easier and safer for the Sandhogs, there's an invisible and deadly threat they all have to be aware of. This is really what's so deadly, really. You see all the, you know, you can see the shiny particles in yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's our biggest enemy down here. When the dust is evident and when the air quality isn't as good as it is right now, we would have masks on. So the, the, the mica, the silica, it gets ground up into a very fine dust. And, Correct. And you get that in your lungs. Yes. But this is the life of a sandhog. Every day, cranes and winches lower enormous drills, bulldozers, and buckets filled with 3,000 pounds of rock over their heads. Rocks fall, tunnels flood, and because sandhogs dig so deep, they face another threat, the bends. During their first project laying the foundations of the Brooklyn Bridge, 27 sandhogs died digging under the East River. People literally died, and it was undocumented, because back in 1883, even New York City hospitals and the, the records department in the city itself wasn't that great. Wow, well, because you know, they would have been the only people going that depth for that long anywhere. And accidents are common. In 1982, two train cars broke loose and traveled unmanned down a steep slope. The Sandhogs couldn't hear them coming because of the loud drilling. One man was pinned against a wall by the car, and another had to have his foot sawed off with a pocket knife to escape. We're basically sight unseen, not like a bridge builder, yeah. uh, not like a guy uh, doing sidewalks or um, doing a Trump Towers. Some people do say we're uh, uh, a guarded, uh, a secret society, a, a secret subculture. But you're a positive force in society. Well, we want to keep New York City a competitive city. We want to go be more competitive into the 21st and 22nd century. We can't have any, up, any other city outshine in New York, you know that. Up next. Long before the Sandhogs first made their mark in New York's underworld, another secret society was building the Big Apple from the bottom up. So you go past here, what do you find? A station platform from 1844. Oh, and later, a secret lair from a time when the gangs of New York ruled the streets. But probably the main thing that they fought was the hatches. Mm. Guns were expensive, mm -hmm. but hatches weren't. This is bloody. So and they, they dragged the, right the bodies right through They the bodies right through again. Did a secret society inspire our founding fathers? 
Log on to history.com slash cities for our web series, The Naked Underground. New York is famous for its legendary subway system with millions of passengers riding the rails 24-7 every day of the year. And there are some locals who would tell you they know every inch of New York's 850 miles of subway line. But for over a century, there have been rumors of a ghost tunnel, a long lost subway line that predates even the oldest subway tunnels in the world. And that's how it remained, lost and forgotten, until a gutsy group of urban explorers finally found the holy grail of New York City's underworld. Most people think London has the oldest subway in the world. But New York actually opened the first subway tunnel almost 20 years before London's underground went public. The tunnel runs 30 feet beneath Brooklyn's Atlantic Avenue, but it's much more than a relic of old New York. The tunnel is filled with legends. Here, bootleggers stashed their moonshine, an assassin hid his long-lost diary, and the country's most famous secret society, the Freemasons, laid the foundations of the world's oldest subway station. Since building a train tunnel in 1844 underground was a huge project that took money and political clout, the Freemasons were the only ones who could pull it off. In 1980, an urban explorer named Bob Diamond unearthed the tunnel and its secrets. Right here? He was going to show me his amazing discovery, but first we had to stop Brooklyn traffic. So this is it right here? This is it. Cool. Yeah, that's the way in. All right, how are we going to get this open? Okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to go and open this up. I'm going to pry this open a little bit from this end. Okay, and I just you're going to Yeah, you're going to take this hook, get it underneath, and then pass it back to me. Okay. We got electricity, huh? Uh, now Power, we got electricity. Anyway. And so is this is this legal, what we're doing here? Well, it looks like it's a little bit gorilla, but it's actually totally legal. I've All had right. a contract with the city of New York for 20 years to do this. All right. Follow you down? Okay, yeah. Right. Follow me in. Let's go. Going here, underneath the streets of Brooklyn, New York, into the oldest subway tunnel in the world. How cool is that? So this whole thing looks like it was filled in with dirt. It was. The dirt came across all the way across like this. So I had about this much space to crawl on my belly between that manhole cover and the concrete wall. So you're in the pitch dark. In the pitch dark with an air tank on my back. Oh, really? we didn't know if there was any air in here. Yeah. And it was just like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Bob pieced together the tunnel's probable location through a newspaper article from 1911 and a map from 1868. He found himself crawling in a dirt-filled tunnel beneath Brooklyn streets. So he and some friends cleared out a hundred cubic yards of dirt by hand. Bob believed the only thing standing between him and the tunnel was a concrete wall. So he set up to blast away the last obstacle. Wow, so you had to blast out this hole here. Yeah, the, 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 was, the casting was there, but it was plugged in with bricks and cobblestones that were cemented in. All right. Oh, man. That's pretty big, huh? This is cool. <laughs> you know it's it. huge. Oh, yeah, it just keeps going. Wow. Now you can see how big it actually is. Sure. The New York subway system officially started in 1904, but this tunnel was its dry run 60 years earlier. At half a mile long, it was the end of the line for the Long Island Railroad at the East River. But because of the train car's poor brakes and the dangerous traffic up above, the tunnel had nowhere to go but underground. This is brand new technology right. in this time. Right. They had no subway yet. Right. Even in London, they had no, no subway. This no. is way before everything. Way before. This was innovation. What they basically did is they took elements of the 19th century industrial revolution and combined it with Roman civil engineering techniques because the Romans built things similar to this for highway underpasses 2,000 years ago. All right. 2,000-year-old Roman engineering met the Industrial Revolution in a method called cut and cover. Instead of mining a tunnel under New York, 
workers were hired to rip out the street with picks and shovels. Once they had dug a ditch 34 by 32 feet and a half mile long, they brought in strong Manhattan bedrock for the walls, six and a half feet thick at the bottom, tapering to four and a half feet thick at the top. Finally, a brick arched ceiling was put in place and the street was relayed over it. Today, the construction is so strong, the brick's strength not only supports the streets, cars, and trucks above, it could hold six times that and not collapse. How do you build a tunnel like this before they'd ever done this? Well, you need to have the right people involved. First, we had Cornelius Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. who was in charge of the construction. Right. Then you had a crew of 900 Irish laborers, which were more effective than steam shovels. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you couldn't do anything in New York State without the Freemasons back then. They ran everything. The secretive Freemasons have long been linked to the founding of our country. George Washington and Ben Franklin were both Masons. From military forts to federal buildings, even the design of our nation's capital, Freemasons controlled the planning and building of our nation's infrastructure. In fact, New York's governor in the early 1800s, DeWitt Clinton, was a grand master of the Freemasons. And he was influential in starting projects like the Erie Canal and New York's Board of Education. Top New York City officials and engineers were also Masons, and they played an important role in getting this groundbreaking project to become reality. For example, the person who took over the Federalist uh, Party and the Freemasons after DeWitt Clinton died was Rufus King, mm -hmm. who was a signer to the U.S. Constitution. His son, John A. King, was the person who got the idea to build the Long Island Railroad to connect New York with Boston. In 1859, corruption brought the whole project down. A greedy real estate developer had the tunnel declared a public nuisance, which allowed him to collect money from surrounding landowners to pay for its demolition. But instead of destroying it, he simply put up two walls, one at each end, pocketing the rest of the money, nearly $130,000, the equivalent of $3 million today. So where we came in, that filled in part, that's where he plugged up that end. Correct. And behind here is where he plugged up this end. Correct. So I'm holding, I'm, I'm pushing on New York City real estate corruption right here. You got it right in the palm of your hands. <laughs> for 150 years, it was the breeding ground for all sorts of scandalous tales. The tunnel was supposedly the headquarters of a whiskey bootlegger at the turn of the century and a dumping ground for Murder Incorporated, the infamous New York Mafia in the 1920s. We found some smashed up five gallon whiskey jugs and a piece of pottery that said Daniel Cavanaugh liquor dealer 20 Atlantic Street. Really? I looked him up in, old, in the old city records and he had a liquor store at the mouth of the tunnel near Columbia Street. So he's brewing his stuff down here. But the biggest mystery has yet to be solved. Behind this second wall is the tunnel's old train platform. A platform Bob believes holds an abandoned locomotive that may contain an assassin's secret. After John Wilkes Booth shot President Lincoln, he was hunted down and killed. Investigators found his diary on his dead body. In May 1865, a conspiracy trial was held, but Booth's diary was conspicuously absent. It was later rediscovered in a War Department file. Only 18 pages were mysteriously missing. So you go past here, right. 200 feet, what do you find? A station platform from 1844. No way. Yeah, they find a portal area made of marble and granite, and there's probably a steam locomotive buried you back have, there. You have proof of this? Oh yeah, the same documentation that I used to find the tunnel says they left a locomotive back there. It's suggested that the missing pages of Booth's diary were hidden in a tunnel near an abandoned locomotive. The long forgotten train car under Atlantic Avenue would have been the perfect location. Mm -hmm. Bootleggers, Prohibition, Murder Incorporated, all kinds of nefarious dealings. This is subterranean New York. Really, this rubble is the building blocks of New York. This whole tunnel of the Freemasons, the proof of their involvement in creating our biggest city. Never mind our whole country. They could get together, create something that had never been tried before. A subway underneath the streets of New York. And this is what goes on to inspire bigger and better and greater projects down the road. Up next, an underworld beneath the streets of Chinatown. CD vice dens, secret escape tunnels, and a battleground for bloody turf wars. So this is it here? Yeah, this is it. This is the Chinatown tunnel. It's where all the gangs used to meet people. And later, after 9-11, security in the skies over New York was never the same. But 150 years earlier, threat of attack came from the sea.
New York City has 722 miles of subway track, over 6,374 miles of streets, and 6,400 miles of sidewalks. Millions of immigrants have made New York the city it is today. But in the early days, immigrants had it rough, and they had to fight for supremacy on every street corner. So they formed separate neighborhoods, all crammed in the middle of the Big Apple. You had the Irish in Five Points, the Italians in Little Italy, and down in Chinatown, two of the most dangerous gangs of all. They all fought for turf by waging bloody battles in the streets and in the underground. Located on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Chinatown covers two square miles, but is home to over 100,000 people. Starting in the 1870s, the area was a safe haven for persecuted Chinese immigrants until gang wars turned it into one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in New York's history. Art Zuckerman is an expert on Chinatown and took me into its dark underworld. I'm good. Welcome to Chinatown. Thank you. So this, this is dead center Chinatown, This right? is, well, this is really old Chinatown. This is as old as you're going to get. Oh, okay. Chinatown has expanded dramatically, but this is really the oldest part of Chinatown. And you can imagine going back to the 1870s to the early 1900s, there were opium dens here. There were gambling casinos, there was prostitution, there was incredible amount and of things. All that, a lot of that was underground here. Well, it is underground because they really be, had to be hidden from the police. In the late 1800s, Chinatown was a haven for businesses of vice and a center of power for Chinese gangs. At the time, the Chinese were emigrating to the U.S. in large numbers. Over 70% of the workforce that built the Transcontinental Railroad were Chinese, but they were treated as little more than slaves with no legal rights and were the targets of brutal racist attacks. There were massacres in the West Coast where Chinese were being killed, and then they had no laws, they had no rights whatsoever. So they started coming to a city that was an immigrant city. Like the Irish in Hell's Kitchen and the Italians in Little Italy, the Chinese banded together in small communities. They formed their own associations and secret societies and developed a self-reliant underground economy. But the social clubs where these outsiders gathered were also fronts for powerful gangs known as Tongs. The Tongs were the American version of a much older secret society in China known as the Triad Society. The Triads were formed in the 1600s to overthrow the ruling dynasties in China. They were rebels and well-trained militants. When they arrived in New York and regrouped, they turned into gang lords, extorting protection money and running seedy businesses. By 1900, the two most powerful Tongs, An Liang and Hip Sing, were locked in constant bloody battles for control of Chinatown's profitable vices, gambling, opium, and prostitution. Probably the main thing that they fought with were hatchets. Mm. Guns were expensive, mm -hmm. but hatchets weren't. Okay. That's why, you know, you got these really cleavers. This is bloody. When they cut your fingers off and things like this, just it was really a very traditional kind of violent area. The most dangerous part of Chinatown was known as the Bloody Angle. It was named that because where Doyer Street curves was a hot spot for Chinese gangs to fight their turf wars. The reason this street was so popular is because if you're in a gang war yeah. and you want every advantage you can get, you're going to hide behind nooks and crannies. I can go in here <laughs> and hide in this corner sure. and all of a sudden someone's coming out over here. You wouldn't see me yeah, and yeah. I can jump out. And that's why this labyrinth of, 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 of networks of highways below the ground level and the tunnels was so great okay. because the surprise element. You could really attack people. So you're saying underneath the street there are tunnels It's a maze, throughout. literally a maze. In addition to alleys and doorways, Chinese gangs used an elaborate underground maze of tunnels and manholes to launch surprise attacks and to disappear when the police tried to stop them. Even today, the people here keep a tight lid on their underground, and many of the tunnels remain blocked off. So this is it here? Yeah, this is it. This is the Chinatown Tunnel. It's where all the gangs used to meet people. So if, what would it have looked like at that time? Well, it would probably be a lot seedier, wooden, uh, dark, maybe kerosene lamps over here. Okay. So really pretty, pretty uh, treacherous looking. 
So this has been all refitted to a modern use now. But all these doors and everything, I mean, suggest that there's more tunnels around here. Oh, there is. Behind every door here, there's a whole labyrinth of tunnels um, that go in here. Today, this is the Wing Fat Shopping Arcade. But in 1900, it was the home turf of the Hip Sing Tong and their leader, Mock Duck, who wore chain mail armor and always carried loaded guns and a cleaver. He would um, shoot these guns indiscriminately, actually close his eyes to do this, and indiscriminately just keep Circle whirling around. around and doing this thing. And very often he would do that, in, and on, on the bloody angle, he would come down here after he shot these people, and this is his um, escape. Mock Duck's escape tunnel was originally a beer storage area for an 18th century brewery. As Chinatown grew up, the tunnel came back into use, connecting Chatham Square with one of the social centers of the day, the Opera House. Performers used it to leave the theater, and so did the Tong. Remember, the opera was for everybody, and sometimes they would mix in public, you know, the, the Tong groups, and all of a sudden they must have gotten into some sort of disagreement in August 1905, and all of a sudden in the middle of these, the theater, the gunshots that are ringing out here all over the place, four people got killed. When the smoke cleared, there were four dead bodies. With the police on their way, Tong members lugged the corpses into the opera basement and through the tunnel. At least didn't want to go down here either. Sure. Because there was a lot of stuff going on here down here. And they'd go to Chatham Square. And so they dragged there. the bodies they'd right drag through. They dragged the bodies right through here. And escaped on the other end. Yes. The Tong War raged on for years. In 1909, 50 men were killed in just one gun battle in the Bloody Angle. Even today, gangs with names like the Flying Dragons and Ghost Shadows fight for control of this small patch of land and its underworld. If you were down here and these are the tunnels, you would be able to ambush from these nooks and crannies. Anybody coming down here wouldn't stand a chance against Chinese hatchet men waiting in the dark. No, we're not that far away from that time. 150 years in the big scope doesn't really mean much. This is only, only refitted recently. So this is all still the tunnel. Basement today, tunnel just a few generations ago. Up next. I don't think anybody's gone past this point. For 200 years, when it's come to defending the nation, New York City has always been on the front lines. Right under the harbor, moving men and supplies, armaments, who knows what, between these two sister forts so they could work together. Gennaro Lombardi opened the first U.S. pizzeria in 1895 in New York. Today, Americans consume nearly 350 slices per second. New York has always been pushed to new heights by secret societies and clandestine organizations operating behind the scenes. And there's no group more secretive or more powerful than the U.S. military. One of the Army's greatest contributions to New York was a strategic fort and underground network that once protected the city's vital waterways, but is now almost forgotten. New York is filled with little secrets, but few people know about the not-so-little secret called Fort Totten. Its design and the innovative weaponry used there protected our nation's biggest city for over 150 years. And I'm meeting Sergeant John McCoy, who's going to show me how this was done. You know how many battles have taken place on the doorstep of America's largest city. New York Harbor was the site of major battles in the Revolutionary War, the Spanish-American War, even World War II when Nazi U-boats sunk over 1,000 ships here, killing thousands of Americans. And then the entire world was shocked on September 11, 2001, when New York's Twin Towers were struck at the tip of the harbor, taking the lives of 3,000 people. For over a hundred years, enemy forces believed they could move right into New York Harbor with little or no resistance. But with a design put in place by military leaders during the Civil War, the harbor forts have been able to keep any boat from ever getting too close to the city. And Fort Totten has been right at the front lines. I got special permission to explore Fort Totten's underbelly. Welcome to Fort Totten. Thank you. Park Ranger John McCoy was going to take me through it. Fort Totten is perfectly positioned to guard Manhattan from an ocean assault. It was built on one side of a narrow channel where the East River spills into the Long Island Sound and less than a mile across the water from another stronghold, Fort Schuyler. Together they created a two-pronged defense system for one of the city's most vulnerable points. The whole lower east and west side of Manhattan was ports, so it, it was in a way sort of like a heart of shipping. So, I mean, New York is vulnerable, America is vulnerable. Exactly. 
Built in 1862, as the Civil War was heating up, Fort Totten had high lookout points, cannons, and soldiers at the ready for Confederate gunboats. But when a new enemy and a new war surfaced 30 years later, the two forts developed a hidden subterranean weapon. In order to save New York, the Army not only went underground, they went underwater, planting a series of underwater mines in the riverbed between them. These mines, also called buoyant torpedoes, were first placed in the 1890s during the Spanish-American War. Arranged in a grid, they were weighted down by anchors so they couldn't be seen. But these weren't the self-explosive modern mines of today. These weapons needed to be activated by the soldiers in the fort. The mines were all connected to a distribution box in the water, and then back to the fort via a long submarine cable. If a soldier saw an enemy vessel approaching, he could activate the specific mine that was closest to the ship, leaving the others intact in case of further assault. So it wasn't the, the ship hitting the mine that, that detonated, it was somebody actually triggering Flipping it off. switch, yes. I never knew that. But Fort Totten had more than an underwater minefield at its disposal. The fort itself was originally designed to hold an arsenal to protect New York during the Civil War. But as weaponry evolved from 19th century cannonballs to heavier artillery in World War II, the design of Totten still worked for hiding highly explosive munitions. Old wall door. Wasn't used too much. Prison cell. <laughs> yeah, on the chamber next to us, the, the same arches here, uh -huh. which me, leads me to believe that they were connected at one point. Yeah. Fort Totten is spread over 49 acres and consists of 70 rooms, including weapon magazines, holding cells, and bunkers. Because it was dug below sea level, water constantly seeps into the fort, creating a damp and eerie atmosphere. God, look how thick the walls are. Yeah. It had, to build it had to be strong. Right. Just to prevent any explosion that would have happened. Now, this is the larger chamber. This chamber is 81 feet long, wow. and it's 22 feet wide. That's pretty wild to think we're underneath the ground here. These chambers were made out of solid granite, and they needed to be to protect the live explosives stored inside. But this Civil War super bunker isn't Fort Totten's only buried secret. For generations, there has been a rumor about a tunnel connecting to Fort Schuyler under Long Island Sound. Just follow me this way. Watch your step. So yeah, it's weird that these this tunnel is high enough for us to stand in. So they meant people to come in here. This passageway may be an entrance to the rumored tunnel. If it is, it would be a stroke of tactical genius. Today, there are 13 tunnels under the East River alone and eight bridges over it. But before 1883, when the Brooklyn Bridge first opened, the only way to get across or communicate with the other side was by boat. This tunnel would have provided a hidden and direct path between Fort Totten and Fort Schuyler. It gets kind of gnarly right here. Very muddy, very gross. Think about this, I mean, we're inside and below a fort that was modern in 1863 and a complete mystery of a tunnel. All right, this is where it really starts to get treacherous and low. I don't think anybody's gone past this point, but we can go a little bit further. Can't really get any further down here. But you can imagine, and it's likely that this goes onward and quite possibly underneath the harbor connecting this fort, Fort Totten, with Fort Schuyler across the way. I mean, think about it. 19th century military, they didn't have the kind of communication devices we have today, obviously. So how useful, how strategic would it have been to have an actual tunnel connecting them? And they could have done it right under the harbor, moving men and supplies, armaments, who knows what, between these two sister forts so they could work together. The tunnel has since collapsed, buried under the harbor forever. Fort Totten's designs were ahead of their time, secrets that helped keep America's largest city safe from enemies over a span of nearly 150 years. And those military secrets continue to be buried somewhere deep in New York's underworld. New York was built on a foundation of secrets. Tunnels used to fight bloody turf wars. A groundbreaking subway tunnel. A speakeasy that defied both feds and mobsters. 
and a dedicated fraternity that literally gave their lives taming the underground every day. New York owes its rise to greatness to sites unseen and groups unheard. Societies that are willing to build the city up by going underground.